such a large crowd and to have a famous speaker with us tonight. Uh, Nelson Bard, we affectionately call him the Bard of Solon. As you know, he is an author, uh, Pioneers with Web Feet, which is the Bible that the Historical Society uses. Uh, whenever some questions come up about our history, we go to his book. And he spent an untold amount of hours to do this. Uh, he also was a pu publisher, which was kind of world famous, Valley News Magazine. Over a period of roughly a dozen years, he published this, and it was a, an outlet for young writers, new writers around the world to submit their writings. And, and he would prove these things and accept them some and turn down others. But he, he, you got published in his book. It was a very good article. Nelson also was a Solon High School graduate. He, he came to Solon, I think he was about 12 years old, was it Nelson? Yeah. Four years old, okay. He went, he went through the school system, graduated from the high school, and, and the most famous thing about his high school endeavors was he was on the 1925 first football championship team that Solon ever had. And this picture of his team is in the Solon High School on the wall there with the other famous teams over the years. He went on from uh, Solon High School to graduate from Hiram College. Uh, that, that's his college alma mater. Uh, he's an avid Indians fan. Uh, when we have meetings, he can't wait to get home and listen to the ball game. <laughs> so we have to rush meetings when Nelson's around. There. Uh, he, and the reason he's such an avid uh, Indians fan, I think, is because of, in his youth, he was a semi-pro hardball player. When it was an Indians team. Was it, it was a minor league, two years in the minor leagues. It was an Indian farm team. Was farm it? team, yeah. So that, that's where he got his interest in, in baseball. Uh, and just recently, this past year, he celebrated 50 years of bar papers, which he founded here in Solon in the basement of his house on Liberty Road, as I understand it. And it has grown and grown over the years. And it, it's amazing. 50 years, he started when he was. Forty-some years old. Thirty-nine. 39 years old. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to make you any older. Yeah. But Nelson will celebrate his 90th birthday this year. He still goes to work every day. Not too many of us are going to be able to do that. I know. But Nelson, Nelson is amazing in that aspect. So I, I wanted to just tell you a few things in his life. I won't go too much, too much further. Uh, tonight's program was about his Navy career. Uh, basically, it was the Second World War, uh, and you, you heard of the Cane Mutiny, written by Herman Wolk. He's going to talk about this a little bit, but that book wouldn't have been if it wasn't for Nelson and his ship and what happened on his ship. He's going to tell us that story tonight. Uh, so he's an author, he's a world-famous publisher, and he's Solon's best storyteller. Now let, let's have Nelson tell us his story of what happened. Nelson Thank you. Thank you. What I'm really going to tell you people about is how a guy can go from a citizen first class to a lieutenant commander and back again in four years. And I'm going to sit down to do it. <laughs> in 1942, right shortly after Pearl Harbor, they had a draft. And Nelson Bard was then 33 years old. And boy, did he get a low figure in the draft. In a couple of months, he was going to be in the Army. And I didn't want to be in the Army. I had owned a 30-foot cabin cruiser, and that made me in the Navy. So I applied for a commission and got it, eventually appearing to a 15-story building in Boston called the USS Fargo Building. Immediately when I got there, floors became decks, toilets became heads, <laughs> stairways became ladders, and you get it, a complete different line of everything. Each new officer was given a copy of the Watch Officer's Guide. This was a book 
that had first been printed in the sailing vessel days and occasionally amended, but not much. There were, there were certain commands that you were to use and there were certain replies that were expected. The upshot was that we had a sort of a stilted a number of commands on our ships. To give you an, an a illustration of this on a ship, I was on the Straits of Juan de Fuca, which is from Seattle to the sea, on one ship, and the lookout called down to the bridge and he said, bridge? And the, uh, the bridge said, bridge I. Now remember, that's right out of the sailing vessel thing. Bridge I. So the guy said, there is a log ahead. Now to the, the answer to that is, where away? Not where's the log, <laughs> where away? The guy says, huh? <laughs> where away? Huh? Where's the log? Oh, hell, you done already passed it. <laughs> the next thing that gave me a fit was navigation. I was a good arithmetic at arithmetics. I had taken all kinds of, of stuff in college, and I could whistle through mathematics pretty darn easy. So in two months at Boston, I got every problem they gave us right. Then they sent me to Miami. These are navigation problems. They would give you the height of Arcturus is 37 degrees, 27 minutes. You are 16 feet high ab above the water. And what solves this problem to get your line of sight? I could do that like a flash. My problem was, I didn't know where Arcturus was. <laughs> I didn't know what to do with a line after I had it. And I had never taken a sight. I didn't even know what a sextant was. I hadn't seen one. But I got through with perfect grades in Boston, went to Miami and did the same thing. At the end of two months there, out of 114 graduates, I was number one. And so I was the first guy assigned and I was sent from Miami to Seattle to become an officer on the PC-603 and I took a railroad ride clear across the country and arrived there, went to the Navy Department, asked where the 603 was and she said she was at sea. I walked down the dock in the PC-603 Three was sitting right at the dock as I was walking past it. Now this is a little bit of a commentary on the efficiency of the Navy. <laughs> <laughs> I went aboard and I found there were five officers already aboard and that's the full complement of, of the ship, five officers on a PC. The problem was that not one of these birds could navigate, and the captain was a graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy. So when I came aboard, they had my record, and they said, you're our navigator. Oh, wow, he said, that's wonderful. When do I find out about stars? What, what's, what's going on? How am I going to be a navigator if I don't know this, what's going on? And they said, we don't care. You're the navigator. It's your hard luck if you don't get it right. Oh boy, it's your hard luck too if I don't get it right. <laughs> so the next thing was that we had orders to go from Seattle to Kodiak in the Aleutian Islands, which if you go up the inside passage is a very tortuous way of going through narrows, Seymour Narrows and high tides, 30, 30 feet tides, if that's a, I said, listen, if you're going up through there, and I don't know beans about this, I'm not going to be your navigator. Well, yes, you are. You've got to be the navigator. You're the only guy that 
that pass these tests. <laughs> we're going to cross the straits. We're not going to, we're not going to go up the inside straight. We're going right across the ocean. I want lots of room. <laughs> So that's the way we went to Kodiak. The minute we left Seattle and got into the ocean, the Pacific Ocean, it clouded over for 10 days. I never saw a star. I never saw the sun. I never saw anything. The only thing that I did know was that the Pacific Ocean had what is known as a set. That means it's like the, the there's a tide moving towards and around the southern edge of the Aleutian Islands. And this is a, about one knot an hour. Well, that's 24 miles a day. So I allowed, for in, in setting the course, for that 24 hours a day, and then we followed a dead reckoning course. After 10 days, we were getting close to where we should have found Kodiak. About noon, or 1 o'clock, on that 10th or 11th day, a sun peeked out. I quickly took a shot of it and got a one line of sight, and then it clouded over again. Three hours later, it took another peak. Now, I advanced my dead reckoning sight took another time, bingo. Now I had two crossing lines. Well, if that's where we are, I said, then Kodiak has got to be over here, change course to such and such, and we'll get there. They said, did you figure that out? Well, sure I figured that out. I hope I'm right. <laughs> we did change course, and we hit Kodiak right on the nose. Well, this, this settled my complaints about not being a navigator. After all, how often is that going to happen? <laughs> well, I was on that ship for about three months. I had a lot of troubles. My name was Bard. The Assistant Secretary of the Navy was Ralph Bard. Was he Uncle Ralph? <laughs> I don't know anything about Uncle Ralph. Oh, yes, you do, yes. Everybody was sure. Everybody was sure that I'd been assigned there because of the pull I had with Uncle Ralph. <laughs> At the end of three months, I was taken off of the ship and sent back to Portland, Oregon to be the second to executive officer on the PC-780. Now, I didn't know anything about the PC-780. But I was glad to get off there. After all, six officers, there wasn't a heck of a lot to do. And I was a navigator, and I wasn't real happy about that. <clears throat> Flew back to Portland, Oregon, got in there, went to Commercial Ironworks, where it was being built. And I said, where is the PC-780? And they pointed to a pile of steel <laughs> and said, that's it. <coughs> what do you mean? We're just in the process of building this ship. Oh, I said, it isn't going to float for a while. No, no, it isn't going to float. It isn't going to do anything. We're working on it right now. We've just finished the 779. Now we're going to work on the 780. I then walked into an office where there was a whole bunch of desks. And one of those desks said 780. And on top of that desk was about three bushel of mail. I sat down and looked at it to see what it was all about. And it was all Navy bulletins, about 18-inch guns, and things which I knew I would never have anything to do with. I was all for throwing it out, but I discovered that I, was, I had to take care of it and record it and license and, and make sure that it was there when the Navy big wings came around. Holy Moses. It was the biggest bunch of stuff I ever saw in my life. I will admit that that wasn't the biggest of my problems. When I went in and sat down, 45 enlisted men came running around and said, are you the officer on this ship? Yes. We haven't been paid in two months. <laughs> <laughs> they had been there living in the barracks. 
without pay because there was no officer to make up the, the payroll. <laughs> well, it took me a while to do that, but I did get them paid. And I became very famous and very much a friend of these guys right away. But they didn't have anything to do. What do you do when you're living in a barracks and nothing else? So I went to the commercial ironworks and I said, hey, what's the matter with you guys? Why don't you make a ball diamond out here and give these guys a place to play or something to do? And they said, well, we got stuff all over it. I said, you sure do. You've got a bunch of steel around it. How? Move it out. Move it out. Let's go. And I sold them on the idea. They sent a bulldozer down. They made a vest. They made a, a field. My guys found some old telephone poles, set it up, made a backstop. And we had, we had a, a, a baseball field. And we set up teams. And we played a sort of intramural stuff. And we had a ball. But there was one problem that I didn't notice about it, and that was that everybody called me Nels. None of this lieutenant stuff and, and hey, I was Nels. And I knew every one of them by their first name. And about a month later, the um, skipper that was going to be in charge of this outfit showed up. And the first thing he said to me, who are you? I told him I was Nelson Bard. I was going to be the executive officer. And who was he? And he told me. And he said, but you're not going to be the executive officer. I've asked for an executive officer. I've asked for an executive officer who's a friend of mine by name. <coughs> and you probably will not be here. OK, that's fine with me. I don't care. There's going to be something for me to do. And we went on. Then he heard me being called Nels. And he had a fit. Why are these people calling you Nels? Don't you know that the enlisted men are supposed to call you Sir? And that you're, you're not supposed to use first names? You've got to be nuts. These guys are just kids. They're right out of high school. And we're just playing ball. There was one other thing. I played with them. And I'd, in a couple of years before, I had played in the minor leagues. And I could knock out flies, I could hit ground balls, I could uh, coach them. And we, had, we were doing well before this guy showed up. <laughs> he, had a, he had his wife join him. And I had my wife come in, because I knew that if there was just a pile of steel, there was going to be a while, that, a couple of months at least, before I would be going out, so Mabel joined me with my little year-old son and 10-year-old daughter. And I found a house to live in that, where an officer was being shipped to Timbuktu or someplace and had his place for rent. So I rented it, moved his family in, and so on. Now, Mrs. Bard said, well, let's invite this family to, to dinner. So I invited the captain and his wife to come to dinner, and they accepted. But they didn't come. And the next day I said, hey, tell me about this. He said, well, I don't believe in inf associating with inferior officers. <laughs> And boy, this, this guy's going to be interesting to live with. <laughs> and I didn't like it very good, very much. But that was the start of a kind of a rough relationship that was going to carry on for about a year and a half. We finally got the ship in the water. It looked like a giant rowboat. <laughs> finally, we got some motors in it. And the motors in this ship were locomotive engines, diesel engines. And they were, uh, they would run one way if you turned them that way, or they'd run backwards just as well if you turned them the other way, which was how you got reversed. You didn't have a gear shift. You ran the, boat, the motors backwards. We finally got this ship into commission, and with 
all these rookies aboard, these kids, we got them in there. We were headed now to San Diego and we were going to be go through a shakedown. We went down the Columbia River to Astoria, which is at the mouth of the river. We tied up there overnight. The next day we were to go out with a bunch of shakedown officers from Astoria. Went out in beautiful weather, got out about 12 or 15 miles, and the captain played around with his ship, going in circles and up and down and every which way, but never recording a single course or change or anything. Then about 2.30 or 3 o'clock, a fog came in and completely closed out everything. You could not see anything. Now, this ship was going to have radar someday, but right then it didn't have any. <laughs> so he comes up to me and he said, you're the navigator, get us into port. I said, Captain, you haven't had any place to start. You never wrote down what you've been doing for the last two hours. That's none of your business. Get us into port. That's your job. With that, he takes off and goes down and goes into his bunk. I thought about it for a few minutes. Now here is something that I had not expected. Complete fog? Wow. But there was something I did remember. I turned on the fathometer and I measured the distance to the bottom of the sea. And it was over 100 fathoms. And on the part, on the chart, there was a line that said, 100 fathoms. So I didn't do anything but take the ship due east on 90 degrees, which would all sure enough later, later get me to the coast of the United States. When it hit 100 fathoms, I made a mark, and then every five minutes at 12 knots, I put another mark and measured the fathoms. Hour after through hour, not really hour, because you could make you'd make ten miles every sixty minutes. Re remember, a fathom, a, a nautical mile is bigger than a land mile. But I found that I had a hundred here, and by moving these things up and down, I could make them jibe. This was a hundred. This was sixty. This was fifty. Over here was 30. I finally thought to myself, I am getting close to the ship that marks the entrance to the harbor. So I said, this is my fix. We'll turn in course from 090 to 110, and we'll slow down further and see if we can find it. They had one thing going for them. They were blasting on the air horns and ringing a bell. Well, we were doing that too. But because we were making such a racket, we shut ours off and trapped along and found this thing right where it was supposed to be. A miracle. Had no idea what I was doing, but it worked. <laughs> we got into the harbor, and the next day we headed off for San Diego. When we got to San Diego, now I had something going for me. Now we had sunlight. And I could tell when the sun was up. And every noon, you knew exactly what your latitude was. You could take a sight, bang, go, there you are. You can see the, sun, the land over here. So you're going to make it all right. I took it into the ship into San Diego. And another group of officers came aboard. And they said, we're glad you're here. We're now going to have a shakedown. And you guys are going to learn how to fire your guns. So there was about. Six or eight officers came aboard. We go out in the ocean, and they have a target out there about the size of an ordinary small ship, but which was made up of oil cans, empty oil drums, with a big piece of canvas on top of it. And they tell us to shoot at it. Well, now, on three-inch guns that we had on our ship, have two lines. One is a vertical line, the other is a parallel line. 
This guy has the vertical, this has the parallel. And you're supposed to keep those crossed on the target. We fired seven shots. We didn't even splash in the water. We must have gone over those targets, way over them, because we never saw anything more. It was just like we were shooting blanks. <laughs> so that was all for us. And then some other ship took it over and did their thing, and they weren't much better. But that night, we were supposed to have night firing. Now these people are aboard, and they're saying, the thing about night firing that's different is that you still shoot three or four flares above the target, and as the flares come down, they illuminate the target. Then you shoot real ammunition at the target. Now you got that? Oh, yes. They talked to the gunners. They talked to everybody. They got that real through. Five minutes before we were to shoot, Captain Bly <laughs> comes down and says to him, what are you going to do? We're going to shoot shells above the target, and then we're going to shoot at the target. No, 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 no. He said, that's not right. No, no, change that, change that. So he puts in something else, and then it says, PC-780, commence firing. Oh, my god. <laughs> they guys lined up, shot three shots with flares right through the rigging of the tug that was pulling it. <laughs> <laughs> now, mind you, we hadn't come close in the daytime, but in the dark, we put them right through the, right through the rigging. <laughs> well, there were lights all over the place, radio, everything, everybody else was calling the whole thing off. We go back into port, and the next day, the captain has a, a hearing. He's going to, they were ready to kill him, I guess. But he blamed everything on inexperienced people. Nothing was his fault, except that there was a black kid who was about six foot four, who was the gun captain on the, on the forward gun. And they put him on the stand and asked him all kinds of questions. He says, this idiot changed everything after he got there. Well, that was not the thing to have said. <laughs> 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 but anyhow, they gave him the benefit of the, dot, of the doubt and let him go. And so we go out and we're going to do some more stuff the next day. And we're, one of the exercises was to take a ship in tow that is supposedly dead in the water. So that one of our ships was the tow E and the other was the tow er. We were the tower. We put over a, a line to this ship. We got it in tow, we pulled it. No problem. When the order was canceled, they were through. The captain slowed the ship down, made an exact 90 degree turn to the right, to starboard. We chopped up the tow motor, the tow line into 20 foot lengths with our <laughs> propellers, and he was back in the soup again. <laughs> Well, you get the idea that this guy had a pension for getting in trouble. And I was a guy that was anxious to live. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I knew there was only one way that was going to happen, and that was I was going to have to look at every order he gave to make sure he knew what he was doing. And I f sure found out over the next few months that he didn't know what he was doing. We went up to the Aleutian Islands, but that was after, after we went, oh, they, first they, they put us on probation, sent us to Eureka, California. We were supposed to be there for a couple of months while we learned how to handle our ship. My wife joined me there with my kids. And there was a guy on our ship, L.J. Glenn. He had no real name, L.J. L.J. Glenn, G-L-A-N-N. And my wife and his wife had become friends there at, at uh, Eureka, and they moved in together. L.J. Glenn's record came aboard our ship, and it said L, in parenthesis, only, J, only, Glenn. 
From there on, he was lonely, jonely Glenn. And, he, and from there on till the day he got out of the service, his paychecks and everything else went to lonely, jonely Glenn. <laughs> Eventually, then, we did go to the Aleutian Islands. And we got up there, and we stayed fairly clear of trouble. But one night, he said he was going to change course at such and such a time. And he didn't want me to check on him, because he knew what he was doing. Now, I should have known better, but I didn't check on him right away. But when I did check on him, we were within the rocks off of an island and we're headed straight for the island. All engines stop, all engines back one third, and I back the, car, the thing away from these rocks back into the channel, and got a new course and went on our way. He comes up and he said, what was the matter? I said, that island over there, you were going to go right over the top of the thing. <laughs> oh, no, he said, I couldn't have done that. I said, look out there. Oh, yeah. I don't know how that could have happened. Well, I said, don't tell me about setting courses without, I'm, if I'm the navigator, I, I want to set the courses, not you. So I got that point across, and, and we went on our way. Eventually, it became quite a routine sort of a, play, a thing. We cruised up and down these islands. We got as far as Attu. Now, does Atu mean anything to you? It is the farthest island in the chain of, of Aleutian Islands. It's about 150 miles from the Kuril Islands of Japan and 75 miles from a Russian island off the coast of Russia. We were out there a long ways. And then the job we had was to go out to a spot of latitude and longitude between us and the Kurils and sit there on our television, on our television, on our radio, and put out MOs, da, 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 all by hand. No, no, our, our radio guys just kept it up. And every day we changed positions. Now then, when our planes came out of Attu, they flew over us, went down and bombed the Curials, came back over us, and went back. And that sort of business came up for two blinking weeks for every ship that drew that duty. As far as I know, the Japs only tried to hit it once and missed. But one night, we were at, in the harbor at Attu, minding our own business and having chow, six o'clock at night or something like that. And our own planes flew back over us, followed by four Jap Bettys who had followed them in. And here we are, minding our own business, eating chow, and the Japs plastered us with 20 or 25 bombs, one right after the other, all over the place. I went out on the deck and I saw these bombs falling in the sea and hitting the runway on the shore. But do you know those Japs never hit anything that was going to be permanently damaged. The next morning, we pushed the holes back full of, full of gravel and sand on the runways, and nobody hit, got even hit. I thought, my god, how could they miss like that? I really thought that this war is going to be won by whichever side is the less confused. <laughs> But there was one thing that happened at Attu. I saw my first mass grave. There were 2,200 Jap dead people out on the island when we took it, and they were buried in a trench and covered up. I did not like it. It looked bad to me. But whatever it was, we now were carrying empty ships back to Yap. Not Yap. ADAC, ADAC. We were going past Kiska. Kiska was held by the, Jap by the Japanese. 
<coughs> but we went around Kiska, bypassed it, and went back. Kiska was left there alone for a number of months. And then they finally decided they were going to take Kiska, went in and bombed it, <coughs> and the next day they invaded it. But that night, the Japs left. They left one guy on the island. There's always some GI that's going to not get the word, and there's, Japs have the same problem. From then on, we did a lot of work at Kiska. We were taking in cement and stuff like that. And that was what we were taking in the night that the captain pulled really a uh, the thing that brought this all about. That night was March 24th, 1944. What's the date, 24th? 54 years ago. We were taking the USS Portland, which was loaded with Portland cement out of Seattle and heavily loaded. And we were several days out of, out of ADAC, and we were heading for Kiska. The storm, which had been pretty bad, now got very intense. And we proceeded on our way. And it was at that point that one of the people on my ship came down and shook me awake in the middle of the night. I'm not going to read it. I've got the whole record here. But I'm going to tell you what he said. Cap the captain has got some funny night orders, and Mr. Dollefeld will not accept the, the con. He will not take over for the ship for the, for the midwatch. I got dressed put on all my clothes, I went upstairs, up, upstairs, upstairs. <laughs> Not so, up the ladder. I got up there, what's going on? And they said, we don't know where the portal is. I went out and on the thing and the, the wind and the snow and the sleet was blowing across the, the ship and it was terrible and it was cold. And I asked these people, what's, what's going on? He said, the captain has come up with some orders tonight that are just ridiculous. He said, what's the saying? He says, we have to stay within 200 yards of the Portland. And we can't see her. Half the time she's underwater, and half the time we're underwater. So I said, well, I'll go down and talk to him. So I ran down, got him out of his bunk, he was asleep. He always slept on his stomach for some reason. <laughs> Rolled him over and said, come up. You've got to come up here. So he got dressed and came up. And I said, we've got to start the radar. Oh, yeah, we had a radar now. We, we had gotten that. I said, we've got to start the radar to find out where this ship is. Rubbish, he says. Rubbish. I said, what do my orders say? He said, stay 200 yards to 1,000 yards from the ship. And they can't see the ship, so how are they going to do that without a radar or without some way of doing it? He said, I'll take the deck. So he did. He assumed the deck, went down below. In the meantime, I'm up there with a spy with my binoculars trying to see something. And I did have one thing going for me. I had pretty good night vision. I looked ahead there, and I said, I think I see something. And I did. I called down, does the captain know that the, the Portland is dead ahead of us? And as the word came back, the captain left the bridge 16 minutes ago and went to his bunk. <laughs> Nobody relieved him? No. <coughs> what was on the rudder? Left slowly. I'm taking command of the deck. Rightful rudder. Starboard engine stop, starboard engine back one third, <coughs> and what we were so close to this ship, 
that my God, I, I just felt we were going to run right into it. But we did get, by having the one engine backing down and the others going forward and traveling at 15 knots, we did have a little bite on the, on the sea. Actually, I didn't see us pass in front of the ship. I was ducking a wave that had just about inundated the whole upper part of the bridge. But when I looked up, we had passed in front of the, of the ship so darn close that it looked like a big building above us. Remember, this, the Portland weighed 10,000 tons and we weighed 650. Kind of a lot of difference. But we missed it. And I said to the, out to the guy at the lookout, I said, how far did we miss that? He said, 50 feet. Another guy said it was 100 feet. Whatever it was, it was too darn close. Now then, in that situation, I talked to them that it wouldn't take the, the, the um, helm. And I said, I want you to take the helm, take the watch, and I'm going to, tell you, I'm going to rewrite the captain's orders and cancel everything and give you new orders. You're to stay 2,000 yards ahead of this ship. You're to stay on 270 degrees true. You're to slow down from 15 knots to 10 knots. And I'm, he said, what about the radar? I said, I'm going to turn it on. So I went down, canceled the captain's orders, and put him in charge. Then I went down to see the captain. The captain, again, was on his stomach, sound asleep. Now, there was one thing about this guy. He was not a good sailor in that he got seasick a lot. But he was on his stomach, and I said, turn over on your back. What's going on? What's going on? Put your feet on the floor. What's up? What's up? I said, Captain, I'm taking over this ship, and I'm taking it into Kiska. I have rewritten your orders. I have changed everything. And you're to stay in your room, in your bunk here, until we get to Kiska. At Kiska, you're free to do whatever you darn please. But right now, you are seated to stay here in this room, in your, in your room. He said, you, you know what this is. It's mutiny. I said, I don't care what it is. But I can tell you right now that it's what's taking place, and you stay here. Then I looked at him. He had a 45 ray revolver hanging from the bunk above him, swinging back and forth. And he looked at it and he said, I won't use it. He said, I, I won't do it. I said, I know you won't, because I knew he was afraid of the gun. And I left the place and went up. Then I made the record, put the records in the book, and we went on into Kiska. And we arrived at Kiska. So now mind you, this is the 24th at 20 minutes or half an hour after midnight. By the time we got to Kiska, it was about 3.30 in the afternoon of the same day. When we got there, he came flying out of the, his cabin, up the ladder, over the side. When last I saw him, he was going to the officers club at Kiska. Well, now, things have been pretty, pretty rickety here. We were trying to figure out what had happened in that 16 minutes in which he had left slowly on the rudder. And what we came to the conclusion was that he had made a complete circle around behind the Portland and was now coming up, and it was on his bow right in front of us. We're still on that, with that left slowly on the rudder. We managed to get rid of it and get out of it and so on. But we were working on this when two guys came aboard. 
They were very tough looking characters. So these were the merchant guys on the Portland. One introduced himself as the master of the Portland. The other guy was a first mate. And they said, what we want to do is see the captain of this ship. Well, he wasn't aboard. He'd, he was over in the officer's club. And so I introduced myself and talked to him about it. And they said that the only reason that they could see that we had not hit him was that they had anticipated that there was going to be a collision, had given left full rudder on their ship, which would give, give us a little more room that way, but had backed down and come to a stop at the time we went past them. Their story was that they were standing still in the water when we went by. Now then, I said, you have, you have your logs that say this? And he said, yes. I, do you mind if I make copies of this? No. Will you sign them if I do? Yes, we will. So I had copies made of their log. And the guy says, well, since nobody got hurt, maybe we shouldn't even, we should forget about it and not do it. I said, no, I don't think that's the way. I said, I'm in trouble here. So I proceeded to show him where I had taken command of the ship for this brief 10 or 12 hours, whatever it was, 15 hours, I guess. And uh, so they agreed to, to make a report, and they did. And so now the stage was set for a naval inquiry. The naval inquiry came after we had gone back to ADAC. We went into ADAC, <coughs> tied up, and they sent us from that a bigger, that was a pretty big area, to a smaller area farther east. So we tied up over there. And no sooner had we tied up when a, a captain, a lieutenant commander, I forget the name, came aboard and said that he was there to conduct a naval inquiry. And f so for the next three and a half days, he did. And this inquiry was a peculiar one. He was the judge. There was an enlisted man who wrote down every, everything. And it was up to each one of us, when we were testifying, to ask ourselves the question and then answer it. In this case, uh, Mr. Dollefeld was the man who, who had actually not taken the deck the night before. Why did you not take the deck? This is, he, had, he asked himself this question. I did it because it was ridiculous, it was out of line, and it was dangerous. So you go through the whole thing, then you, everybody, the captain and everybody else went through this testifying by asking himself questions and then answering them. When it came the captain's turn, he said that the reason that he did not like Mr. Bard's actions was that he disobeyed his orders. And then he goes on to tell about one thing and another where he had told me to do something and I wouldn't do it. One of which, well, it turns out that, that as soon as he said that I wouldn't obey his orders, the, the Foley was the guy's name, Commander Foley, put me on the stand and said, I have just heard him say that you did not obey his orders. Tell me about not obeying his orders. I said, well, first, sir, he put the ship in danger. And I'm talking about the night of March 24th, when he had a lot of this thing. Oh, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. That's a separate thing. We, I, we are not going to talk about that. What other time did you disobey his orders? <coughs> oh, they're stupid little things. Like what? Well, the captain ordered me at 12 o'clock at midnight to dump the garbage over the side of the ship while it's in port. There's a 
letterhead right there, right where we're saying from the Admiral Whitehead saying that garbage was not supposed to be dumped overside. Dump it at sea when you're out away from this place. Did you dump it? No. Well, I guess you did disobey an order. Yes, I did. What other kind of orders did he ever give you? Well, he found out that Mrs. Glenn, Lonely Joanie Glenn's wife, and my wife were living together in Eureka. Well, what about it? He ordered me to have these women separate and get to get apart, that they were not to be allowed to be together because it was an officer's wife and an enlisted man's wife. What'd you do? I told him to go to hell. <laughs> <laughs> what was your reason for that? My wife didn't join the Navy. Glenn's wife didn't join the Navy. They were minding their own business and I wanted the Navy to mind its own business. Well, you get the idea. This thing went on for about four days with one thing after another, telling about the captain running almost over the, the island that, that I pulled him back on. There was all kinds of stuff. Everybody had his own different idea of where the captain had done some screwy thing. Went on for three or four days and the thing came to an end. And now came the question is, what is going to be done about this? And a couple of days passed with nothing. And then one day, a boat requested permission to pull alongside. And we granted it. He pulled alongside. And it was the PZ-1082, which is up in the left-hand side there. It was his executive officer. The guy's name was Buck Tassi came aboard and he said that he was to become the new executive officer on the 780. And I was to be called back to his place, the 1082. So it took me about 15 minutes to get ready and I was on my way to the 1082. Once this change had been made of equal for equal, executive officer for executive, now came the next step. The captain was relieved of command and Tassie became the captain. Oh, what did they do with the, with the captain? Well, they put him on board a canning ship that had 25 rooms on it. It was a salmon canning ship that had been used in peacetime had no motors in it, but it did have workshops. It had lathes and welding equipment and all that sort of stuff. But the main thing the Navy wanted was those rooms, the 25 rooms, because they became a, a floating officer's wardroom, wait until they got them shipped back to the state or to their new ship or whatever. So he is now the commanding officer. How many people on that ship? A cook and two black guys who were mess boys. He had to write a report every day as to who was there, what they were doing, and what he was doing to make the, the, uh, it a better ship. At the end of one month, he was sent to an island of Amchitka. Amchitka is on a map there. Melanie very carefully showed where it is. <coughs> And he was to take command of an island. On this island was a, an emergency landing field. Seven enlisted men and this new captain. He was a commanding officer of Amchitka. In the meantime, while he was doing those things, my ship that I had gone to went back to, to Seattle. And the idea was, of course, to get us out of the area because you would not believe the scuttlebutt that was going on as people told about how this mutiny had taken place and what was going on. So they got us out of there and sent us out eventually to the Central Pacific. 
Our first convoy was out of San Diego. We had a LST full of beer headed for, for uh, Honolulu. We got there, we dumped the beer or left the beer there, picked up a uh, floating dry dock and went to Aniwetok. From Aniwetok we went to Guam. <clears throat> and so that was that part. Now, this, this story really is in two parts. The one part ended when, when there was no, nothing done. There was no, no court martial and so on. But when I got to Guam, I became captain of the ship. And there were only five ships in Guam like mine. But for some reason or other, I was made the commanding officer of a flotilla of five ships. And I tried my level best to do what was necessary, but it was tough because the Navy in its in its brilliance <laughs> sent engines of one sort out there and then spare parts to the Mediterranean. <laughs> we had Buddha engines on there for electricity and Buddha engines were great engines. But if they got fuel with water in them, the springs broke in the valves and you couldn't run them. Well, this happened right after I became flotilla commander. And I didn't know what to do. We were trying to make springs out of Jeep springs and everything else, and we were getting nowhere. In fact, eventually we took the two motors and put them together to make one run. And then one day, there was a farmer on board my ship from Kansas by the name of Randall. Randall was sitting on his bunk, and he looked down at this bunk, and here was a spring with a hook over this that went over a, a rod around the bunk. On the other end was another hook, and that hook to a mattress sort of thing, metal, and the other side. And he took eight of those springs off his own bunk. There's about 28 of them on a, on a bunk. So he took some odds and ends, went down to his place, cut off the hooks, smoothed them down, put them in the places where, they, where they, we had no springs, started up those Buddha engines and whammo, we were back in business again with bunk springs. <laughs> that, that was just one of the little things that it took to make those things run. We, we, every ship as they came in, and I finally started with five and ended up at 26 ships finally, every one of them was running on bunk springs. <laughs> <laughs> it was wild. Well, now here's where, here's where we come into the Cane Mutiny. One of the ships that came into us was a PCE, which didn't match my ship. It was bigger and slower. But this PCE came in. The captain from that ship and a junior officer came aboard to report for duty. And this junior officer started telling me about the mutiny that took place in the Aleutian Islands. <laughs> and he starts right out by saying, this executive officer took a 45 gun, marched the captain down to his bunk, and handcuffed him to his bunk. <laughs> well, you guys are crazy. I said, where'd you hear that? He said, that's all over the illusions. <laughs> you guys have made up a bunk, bunky story here. This is not possible. What do you know about it? So I said, sit down. I'm going to talk to you. So he did, and it's captain too. And I discussed what had really happened. And I told them a little story uh, about one of the dumb things that happened. When I was on the 780, you got your food, or any, any ship, you got your food by quarterly amounts. In other words, each month when you went in to get fresh food, whether it's meat, 
butter, eggs, or whatever it might be, a PC drew one-fourth as much as a destroyer did because we had fewer people, 66 people on the ship instead of 200 or 300. So you got proportionately the same. Well, our proportion up there consisted on one occasion of a big stalk of bananas, green as green could be. And when they came back aboard, the captain said, that's for the officers. So he takes this stock of green bananas into the wardroom, ties a rope around it, puts it over a pipe, and he says, we'll wait for it to ripen a little bit. And he goes on about his business. So this is about 1.30 in the afternoon. At 4.30 in the afternoon, he comes back in the wardroom and there isn't a banana on that stock. <laughs> Just a stock hanging there. <laughs> Now, I don't know whether the guys ate those bananas or threw them overboard. I don't know what they did with them, but I didn't see them doing anything. But he was going to court-martial every guy on the ship and held an held a, a, a inquisition of some sort. Did you do it? Did you do it? Did you do it? No, nobody knew anything about it. Nobody had anything to do with it, and so on. Now, in the Cane Mutiny, that came out to be strawberries. I think the bananas were better because I can't imagine stealing strawberries as much as, as easily as bananas. But whatever it was, that was it. I also told him about chewing up the toll line. And if you recall, in the, in the Cane Mutiny, there is a toll line, toll line that gets chewed up. So that's the only claim where I know of two items that he did take and use. On the other hand, the guy that played the captain in the Cane Mutiny was a dead ringer for this guy. <laughs> so I, th I take a lot of credit for that. And that, I think, is as close as I'm going to talk about it because the rest of the story is the second half of my career. In, and this was all in the Aleutians, Iwo Jima, we sank a submarine on the way to Iwo Jima once. We had, we had a very active career. And that, I think, is where I'm going to quit. Now, if you people have any questions, I'll be glad to try to answer them. Milton, how much is a fathom? A fathom is six feet. Six feet. Right. So 100 fathoms was 600 feet deep. Walk. Was he another? Was he an officer? Yes. The writer of the story. He was. He was the junior officer okay. that was on my ship. Do you know what happened to the uh, captain or whatever? Well, let, let me let me tell you that there is where I have to have a hearsay. I've heard, but I don't know for sure what happened. But he was on that island six months after the war was over because the Navy forgot he was out there.